Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ty Lossiter. I am the uh, Director of Clinical Training for the Psychology Internship Program and partly responsible for our, our Grand Round speaker today because um, he also came yesterday and gave a talk to the Psychology Internship Program for our what was then the Shigatomi Memorial Lecture. Um, and so we are also, we were seeing if he would be willing to do our grand rounds, and he was. So he is actually here today to present the Ripley Memorial Lecture. Um, Dr. Hall is actually quite uh, established here at the University of Washington himself. He actually did his undergraduate degree work here, went to his graduate school at Fuller Semin Seminary, Theological Seminary, and then came back and did his internship here at the um, University of Washington in our psychology internship program, stayed on as a postdoc, and actually continued to work in our department as a uh, clin uh, clinical instructor as well as a researcher um, for a number of years before embarking on his own academic career, which has landed him now at the University of Oregon where he's at now. He is interested in culture and mental health, cultural adaptations of psychotherapy, and Asian American psychology, and he is the winner of the 2013 Lifetime Achievement Achievement Award from the Asian American Psychological Association. Um, there is tons of things on his CV that I can continue to impress you with, but I'm going to hold all off, off and just have Dr. Hall come in and introduce himself a little bit more and tell you about his talk today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for uh, being here today. It's an honor to uh, give this lecture and to be back in my hometown of Seattle, I'm, I'm so old that I can remember when the Space Needle was being constructed. So uh, I, I'm pretty old, uh, but uh, it, it is always nice to come back to Seattle. And actually my uh, youngest daughter is an undergraduate in psychology where I was an undergraduate uh, here at the UW uh, uh, many years ago. So it's uh, uh, deja vu in, in, in some ways. So, um, I uh, want to talk to you about uh, choosing a treatment, which is like sushi, choosing sushi, uh, personalized medicine as an approach to disparities. So I want to start with the sushi analogy. So this is maki sushi. So you have uh, uh, nori, which is seaweed. Uh, there's rice, there's rice vinegar, there's fish, uh, there's vegetables, an egg. Uh, and then uh, the nari sushi is rice in a tofu pouch. Uh, we sometimes call them footballs. Uh, this is traditional and simple and uh, is my favorite. And you're here in Seattle, so you're sophisticated. So you know that sushi is more than uh, just uh, raw fish or sashimi. So th th this is traditional, simple uh, sushi that actually is my favorite. <clears throat> There's also the California fusion roll. So you have uh, fake crab meat and avocado and mayonnaise and white sesame. So that's a different kind of sushi that uh, involves some Asian and American elements. And then another type is the Philadelphia roll, which is uh, distinguished by including cream cheese. So uh, if you had to choose one, what would it be? This traditional type or the fusion uh, California roll or the Philadelphia roll. So we'll, we'll, take, we'll take a little poll. So you can only choose one. Uh, so, the, so this is the traditional type, uh, very simple. This is, uh, uh, has some fake crab and avocado and some American elements and this has cream cheese. And, and there's not a right answer. And I, I know those of you who are online, you can't actually vote or I can't see your vote, but just as a show, so you can only choose one. So uh, how many would choose the simple uh, simple choice, the, the traditional choice? Okay, a few. How many would choose California roll? A few more, and then how many would choose cream cheese? Uh, and there's no shame in any of these, okay. <laughs> so uh, that's good. We, there, there's kind of a distribution here, which, which uh, uh, shows that people have different uh, preferences for sushis, and that may also be the case for psychological treatments. Uh, these days we have personalized sushi, if you would, you want to call it that, so people will buy what they like. There's all kinds of different types of sushis. You can have different types of rolls, different ingredients. Uh, uh, there's many types, and, and sushi bars have become popular, and uh, people can choose what they want. 
but I, I contend that uh, conventional psychological interventions have not been personalized. So you're being offered one type of uh, treatment or sushi with the analogy, and patients are often off offered cream cheese, which is the American version without much of an Asian element. And uh, many patients want something else. They're looking for something different that isn't represented in what is offered in the available treatments. So uh, to give you an outline of what I want to cover today, so I'll first I'll discuss mental health disparities and then a theoretical framework, uh, then some recent work, uh, new work I'm doing in social neuroscience, and then finally uh, uh, talk about a personalized medicine approach for Asian Americans. So um, this graph shows that uh, people of color in all age groups are less likely than European Americans to use mental health services. And, and this is uh, something that's been persistent. So using this sushi analogy again, uh, people of color aren't buying mental health services either figura figuratively or, or literally. So with the sushi analogy, if there's sushi available that you don't really want, you're not gonna buy it. You're not going to uh, find it uh, uh, something that you want to eat. And similar to with, with psychological services, mental health services, what is available for many people of color is simply not uh, something that is attractive to them. And this pattern of mental health service util underutilization by people of color has persisted for at least uh, 40 years since Stanley Sue documented this here in King County. Uh, so all of the developments over the past 40 years, uh, including the evidence-based treatments movement, have not impacted this mental health underutilization statistic. So someone could say, well, you know, maybe that's not such a good thing. Underutilizing mental health services maybe means that people of color are more mentally healthy. They don't need the services. So why is that uh, a bad thing? Well, there's some epidemiological work uh, that uh, indicates that over half of whites, when they experience psychological distress, seek mental health services, whereas a third or, or less of Asian Americans and African Americans and Latinx uh, people in the community seek mental health services when they experience psychological distress. So for many European Americans, uh, seeking mental health services is the default, whereas for other groups, seeking mental health services is not the default, and uh, it is something that only a minority of these groups actually do when they experience distress. Uh, what's happening is that they're either not ex seeking services or, or seeking alternative types of services that might uh, involve healers or something in their community or it might be uh, a religious person, but they're not seeking mental health services. Credibility of therapy uh, has been found to affect help-seeking intentions. So this is some work by Jen Kim and Nolan Zane, and what they found is that relative to white Americans, Asian Americans view therapy as less credible, and they also have lower intentions to seek help. So credibility involves whether the treatment is seen as uh, something that might be actually effective. And because therapy is not seen as uh, credible, uh, Asian Americans are, are unlikely to seek help. And for both Asian Americans and whites, credibility of therapy was more strongly associated with help seeking than perceived severity of problems, perceived susceptibility of problems, or stigma associated with help seeking. So the, the credibility or the legitimacy uh, of the treatment in, in actually being effective is very important for Asian Americans and for, for white Americans. So credibility of the treatment is, is important for all clients, but particularly for Asian Americans who tend not to seek treatment and, and, and tend to seek treatment at lower rates than any other ethnic group. So the credibility of the treatment is something that may be 
uh, a critical factor in uh, this underutilization uh, statistic. Uh, so in terms of a theoretical framework, uh, Lacan and Murray in 1950 have their uh, famous tripartite model, and they suggest that every person is in certain respects like all others. So this is a universal dimension. Uh, every person in certain respect is like some others. So this is a group dimension. And every person in certain respects is like no others, the individual dimension. So in interventions need to become more responsive to the needs of diverse populations and uh, needs need to attend to all of these different dimensions. The evidence-based treatment movement has, has not decreased these mental health utilization disparities, as I mentioned before. And this is because of an overemphasis on the universal dimensions. Cultural contexts are not adequately considered. So again, to use the sushi analogy, if you're looking for uh, fish and rice and, and uh, some vegetables and the sushi that's uh, uh, offered only has cream cheese, that's not something that's going to be seen as uh, useful to you. Uh, the assumption of those who make sushi with cream cheese is that, is that that's going to be uh, something that most people like or perhaps everybody likes, but not everybody likes it. And, and similar to with treatments, our, our interventions that are evidence-based are evidence-based uh, primarily for mainstream white Americans and not for other groups. But the assumption is, is that these mainstream interventions apply uh, to everyone, but that isn't necessarily the case. Uh, there, there's a tension in the literature between fidelity and fit. Uh, so Felipe Castro and his colleagues, Felipe was a graduate student at the University of Washington in the uh, 1970s uh, in clinical psychology. So uh, there is this tension between the fidelity of non-adapted interventions versus the contextual fit of culturally adapted interventions. So interventions delivered with fidelity are assumed to be universally applicable. And fidelity involves uh, adhering to a treatment manual and, and specific procedures uh, that uh, ensure that a treatment will be uh, delivered and, and replicated in the way that is intended to be delivered. And so any modification of the uh, protocol is seen to compromise fidelity and also is assumed to decrease its effectiveness. However, an insistence on fidelity can impede the development of personalized medicine. So if you're insisting that uh, adherence to the treatment manual is the only way that a treatment is going to be effective, you, you may overlook much of what is important about an individual in terms of their cultural and personal context. Uh, Nolan Zane, my colleague, has uh, contended that an insistence on fidelity can actually perpetuate health disparities. And, uh, you know, I think th there's evidence of that. Uh, Evidence-based treatments have not reduced health disparities, mental health utilization disparities. Uh, this insistence on these universal treatments has not uh, uh, been more attractive to uh, people of color than uh, treatments that are not evidence-based. So in evidence-based, uh, fidelity alone is not the answer to uh, mental health disparities. Uh, so the fit component here is, is cultural adaptation. Uh, cultural adaptation uh, helps the treatment to become more applicable uh, or more relevant in a cultural context. Uh, Gimro Bernal and colleagues uh, define cultural adaptation as a systematic modification of an evidence-based treatment or intervention protocol to consider language, culture, and context in such a way that it is compatible with the client's cultural patterns, meanings, and values. So, this is a, a careful and serious consideration of culture in trying to uh, adapt these uh, 
universal treatments to be more responsive to the cultural context. Now, those who contend that fidelity is, is critical would contend that such cultural adaptations compromise the uh, effectiveness of treatment. So the question is, do cultural adaptations actually decrease treatment effectiveness? What is the evidence? Uh, in a meta-analysis that uh, my colleagues and I did uh, a few years ago, uh, in which we included uh, 78 studies of nearly 14,000 people of uh, various ethnic backgrounds in the United States and worldwide, uh, we found that the uh, mean effect size of culturally adapted treatments versus other interventions or no interventions was about 0.67. So culturally adapted interventions were more effective than other interventions that were not adapted or no interventions, uh, an average of uh, uh, two-thirds of a standard deviation. So, so the cu cultural adaptations perform two-thirds of a standard deviation better than these other conditions. So these are the effect sizes side by side, and as you can see, uh, most of them are greater than zero, and the mean again is 0.67. So overall, cultural adaptations outperform uh, unadapted interventions. Uh, so cultural adaptations don't compromise treatment effectiveness. They actually can improve treatment effectiveness uh, uh, for people of color. But uh, culturally adapted treatments that have been available for about 15 years now uh, also have not decreased mental health utilization disparities. And you think, well, you know, these cultural adaptations are specifically designed to uh, improve uh, treatment effectiveness and attractiveness, but uh, they haven't had much of an impact either. And, and it could be argued, well, they haven't been disseminated or uh, they're too expensive and they're, they're not widely available. But uh, uh, these, these treatments, have overemphasized the group dimension. So cultural adaptations are not equally apt applicable to all members of a cultural group. So if you have an intervention, for example, that's uh, developed for Latinx Americans that's delivered in Spanish, not all Latinx Americans speak Spanish, not all Latinx Americans are at equal levels of acculturation, uh, not all Latinx Americans are at the same levels of, uh, of uh, knowledge with respect to psychotherapy uh, or, or uh, mental health literacy. So you don't have uh, a, a homogeneous group. So even though you've developed an intervention that's for Latinx Americans, it's not going to apply to every member of the group. So cultural relevance is not necessarily personal relevance. So I, I contend that a failure to integrate the universal group and individual dimensions has perpetuated mental health disparities. So uh, again, the uh, evidence-based approach has emphasized the universal, the cultural adaptations approach has, inter has overemphasized the group level, but uh, neither approach has uh, focus enough on the individual level. And uh, so a consideration of all these levels, I contend, is important in delivering the most personally relevant treatments to an individual. Stanley Sue and Nolan Zane, uh, in a classic American psychologist article uh, on the role of culture and cultural techniques in psychotherapy, uh, propose a, a proximal distal model. So mental health services, they contended, have focused on variables that are distal to treatment outcomes. So universal treatment methods, uh, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, focus on a person's thoughts, 
and emotions, uh, broad group-based cultural variables such as uh, an emphasis on interpersonal functioning, for example, uh, in interdependent groups have focused on uh, a variable that's very, also very distal to treatment outcomes. Uh, so uh, both the universal approach and the group-based approach have missed the mark because they've been applied too broadly. Uh, the group-based approach less broadly than the universal approach, but the group-based approach nonetheless has been applied broadly to groups such as Asian Americans or Latinx Americans. So a more proximal variable to treatment outcome is personal relevance. So how meaningful and useful an intervention is to an individual. So uh, this is proximal to treatment outcomes because uh, if a person believes that an intervention is meaningful and useful, they're more likely to be engaged in the treatment and they're more likely to uh, uh, adhere to the treatment protocol and, and uh, uh, not drop out of treatment and, and benefit from the treatment. Whereas if the treatment is seen as, pro as distal to their own goals, they may be less engaged with the treatment. So engagement in treatment uh, uh, is a function of how personally relevant the treatment might be. In terms of some proximal mechanisms of healing, uh, Stanley Sue and Nolan Zane suggested that credibility and giving are uh, important components. Uh, credibility involves, is the treatment perceived as a client as effective? So I discussed uh, how credibility for Asian Americans in particular is relatively low for ex existing treatment. So how credible is the treatment and then in terms of giving, is a treatment practical for the client? Uh, does the therapist provide a practical gift to the client? And, and these gifts might be something immediate such as symptom relief or reassurance in the first sessions because uh, another uh, consistent finding with people of color is that they tend to drop out of treatment after a single session. And so it's important to get them engaged and give them something that is uh, immediately practical in the first session of treatment. So this gift giving idea is uh, similar to Asian gift giving traditions uh, in Japan. It's known as omiyage, where you uh, have a gift uh, that you uh, uh, give to someone uh, it, when you first meet them. So several years ago, uh, uh, I was my wife and I were adopting our oldest daughter in Japan, and there was actually an elaborate series of gifts and certain types of gifts that we had to give to the doctor who delivered our daughter. He wanted a certain kind of whiskey. Uh, the adoption agency person uh, wanted a certain type of handbag, and it was a certain brand and so forth. So there's this ritual and, and protocol around gift giving in Asian cultures, and similar in Similarly, in psychotherapy, uh, receiving a gift, receiving some immediate benefit is very important. That's part of the protocol. So if uh, a client comes to treatment and is expecting some immediate benefit and they don't receive it, that may cause them to uh, terminate from therapy or not become engaged in the therapy. So credibility is a treatment perceived as effective, and then giving is a treatment practical, and does it produce some kind of immediate Benefit. Those are two critical components uh, and mechanisms of healing, according to Sue and Zane. Another relevant uh, theoretical model that's analogous to the proximal distal model of Sue and Zane is the elaboration likelihood model of persuasion by Petty and Cassiopo, uh, first developed in. 1986. So you may have heard of this model in social psychology if you have that uh, kind of background, but messages are more persuasive when engagement with their content is high. So this is known as central processing. So uh, there's high uh, message engagement, and this, this is a proximal variable uh, to treatment in terms of the proximal distal model. <laughs> Uh, peripheral processing is low engagement, uh, and, and this involves distal variables. So central, central processing is, is a focus on the intended message. 
whereas peripheral processing is is a focus on peripheral issues. So if uh, a client comes to therapy and they're not really engaged, they're going to focus on the uh, uh, clinician's uh, hairstyle or their clothing or the building or something like that that's really not uh, uh, important. Uh, whereas if they're uh, involved in central processing, they're going to focus on the intent or the message that the therapist is trying to communicate. So personal relevance uh, can in increase engagement. So personal relevance is the individual dimension that I've been discussing. So uh, the goal here is to activate central processing, processing uh, when a person is engaged in therapy and to minimize the peripheral processing of, uh, of therapy. Okay, so uh, I want to now turn to some social neuroscience approaches that uh, uh, are, are involved in some of my uh, current work. So uh, neural activation increases in self-processing networks, and this is the medial prefrontal and posterior cingulate cortices. Uh, the, so neural activation increases in these uh, networks, which are implicated in central processing of uh, persuasive messages. So Cassiopo uh, and his colleagues uh, uh, have a paper Cassiopo passed uh, recently, but uh, uh, these areas of the brain are implicated in the central processing, processing of uh, persuasive messages. So an example of this is that activation in, in medial prefrontal cortex uh, uh, increased while people viewed uh, New York, or, or, or activation in the medial prefrontal cortex while people were viewing New York Times articles predicted the likelihood that these participants would choose to share those articles with others on social media. So if you're in the fMRI scanner and you're reading these New York Times articles, and your M MPFC is activated, uh, that MPFC activation in response to these articles predicts which of those articles you're going to share with others. So the assumption here is that those articles that you share with others are, are personally relevant. Uh, my colleague Elliot Berkman and some of his colleagues have uh, conducted some interesting work with smoking cessation uh, in a study in 2011, and uh, uh, this is a study uh, called Neural Activity During Health Messaging Predicts Reductions in Smoking Above and Beyond Self-Report. So these are 28 heavy smokers attempting to quit smoking, and they were presented with 30-second professionally developed TV commercials designed to help smokers quit smoking, and while being exposed to these uh, TV commercials, uh, they uh, self-reported the personal relevance of these commercials. Uh, they self-reported their intentions to quit smoking. They uh, rated their own self-efficacy, the likelihood that they could actually quit smoking. And then they were also scanned with the uh, fMRI scanner. And the outcome was self-reported smoking and exhaled carbon monoxide a month later. So. Uh, fMRI imaging of uh, brains uh, while they were exposed to TV commercials as well as self-report. So the findings were as follows. Self-report did predict behavior change. So self-report of the personal relevance of these smoking ads, uh, uh, smoking cessation ads did, uh, was associated with behavior change, but neural activity in the medial prefrontal cortex predicted behavior change above and beyond self-report. So in, in uh, an interpretation of this result is that brain activity, neural activity, was a better predictor of behavior change than self-report. So this is neural activity of an area of the brain, medial prefrontal cortex, that's associated with personal relevance. So if a treatment, in this case, smoking cessation intervention is, is uh, perceived as personally relevant either by self-report or uh, by brain activity, this personal relevance predicts actual behavior change. 
So uh, Elliot Berkman and I and Nolan Zane, uh, Wei Chen Huang, and our colleagues uh, wanted to apply this model, uh, this, this social neuroscience model, to uh, psychotherapy. So this is a project that we're engaged in uh, entitled a patient-centered approach to determine the personal relevance of an intervention. And we applied the smoking cessation paradigm uh, involving self-report and fMRI assessment uh, of personal relevance to evidence-based interventions, evidence-based psychotherapy interventions. So I'll talk a bit now about this personalized medicine uh, approach with Asian Americans. Uh, so first of all, why Asian Americans? Well, Asian Americans are the fastest growing ethnic group in the United States. Uh, they're the, <laughs> the group that's least likely to seek mental health services. Uh, they're one of the least represented ethnic groups in clinical trials and cultural contexts where Asian Americans may influence health seeking and treatment outcomes. So there's cultural reasons and uh, other reasons in terms of uh, mental health disparities to study Asian Americans. So uh, the Asian American cultural context in, involves uh, an emphasis on loss of face. So face is one's prestige and position in society involving two components, men su, uh, which is one's reputation accumulated through achievements such as academic achievements, career achievements, financial achievements. And then the second component is lien, which involves one's moral reputation. What is your reputation in the community? What is your moral reputation? Are you seen as a good person, a moral person who uh, abides by uh, community standards? Loss of face involves loss of prestige and status. So this is a violation of collective norms. So if you're expected to, uh, to have certain responsibilities uh, in your work and you don't fulfill those responsibilities, you're going to lose face, not only for yourself, but for your family. So face is something that is carried by your whole group. It's not just an individual uh, loss of face. It's face for one's family, one's community, those who, who one uh, is connected with. Loss of face is something that Asian Americans are more concerned about than European Americans. So this is uh, a summary of uh, some studies by Fred Leong and his colleagues. Uh, Asian American women and Asian American men were more concerned about loss of face uh, than European American men or women. And, and this loss of face measure involves uh, uh, dimensions of shame or uh, concern about the impact of one's behavior on one's uh, uh, reference group, such as one's family. Uh, but what's interesting here is that European Americans are also concerned about loss of face to some degree as well. So the range here is 21 to uh, 147. You have scores here in the 80s and 90s for both uh, European Americans and Asian Americans. So. Uh, in, in many ways, everyone is concerned to some degree about loss of face, but Asian Americans are particularly concerned about loss of face for cultural reasons, because they're part of a group and they're concerned about the impact of the behavior on the group. So saving face uh, can occur if one fulfills one's role as a member of a group. So saving face can occur in family context. I'm a good son. I'm a good parent. I'm a good... Uh, uh, daughter, I'm a good uh, uh, child uh, taking care of my elderly parents, uh, I'm a good student in a school context, I'm a hard worker, I've achieved a lot. So uh, saving face can uh, involve fulfilling one's role as a member of uh, a group. And therapy can actually assist in saving face if it is practical and pragmatic and focuses on a person's uh, social roles and uh, achieving and fulfilling those social roles. Uh, loss of face is also associated with mental illness. So mental illness as a personal disease can cause face loss. And uh, uh, if mental illness res resides in a person and is seen as a disease, this disease isn't just a personal illness, but it's an illness that uh, uh, affects one's whole family, 
uh, I have this illness because my family hasn't been taking care of me. That's the implication. Uh, and so concern about face loss, as you might guess, is negatively uh, associated with self-disclosure in therapy. So if you're concerned about losing face, you, you don't want to disclose your problems. Uh, you don't want to air your dirty laundry to others uh, who, because that will cause face loss. So approaching personal issues as solving specific external problems, such as family work and school, can actually save face. So the approach is credible. Uh, in Sue and Zane's uh, uh, model, it, it's credible because it's seen as doing something practical and affecting one's uh, everyday life, uh, helping one fulfill one's social roles. And then it also provides a practical gift. It's something that uh, provides something uh, that's immediately uh, effective. I'm a better student. I'm a better family member. I'm a better worker. So, uh, we were interested in loss of face and, and two universal treatments. One is cognitive behavior therapy, which most of you are probably familiar with. Pro, uh, co pro, cognitive behavior therapy involves homework, daily monitoring. It involves cognitive management of one's mood. It involves engaging in pleasant activities. and involves in, uh, in improving relationships with others. But there's much face loss potential in c cognitive behavior therapy because uh, it does involve disclosing one's moods, one's thoughts, even pleasant activities are focused on the self, not necessarily on other people. Improving relationships with others is, is important, but usually it's not as much of an emphasis as the cognitive and affective component. So uh, talking about one's emotions and thoughts can be a source of face loss, whereas problem-solving therapy that was developed by Art and Christine Nezu in 1986 uh, has the potential to immediately save face. So this is a focus on goal setting and external problem solving. Uh, so this practical approach, and, and again, this is a universal treatment that's been not developed just for Asian Americans, but it's a, a treatment that is uh, has been developed as a general intervention. This Practical social problem solving approach may uh, allow clients to save face in treatment. And not just Asian American clients, but any client who is concerned about face loss and therapy. If they can uh, achieve something immediately that improves their life, improves uh, their functioning in different social capacities, that can cause them to save face. So, uh, in terms of cultural group considerations, we hypothesized, my colleagues and I hypothesized that the personal relevance of problem solving therapy would be greater than the personal relevance of cognitive behavior therapy for Asian Americans because external problem solving is credible. Uh, it allows a client to save face. There's a focus on family, school, and work issues. There's less of a focus on the self. And the external problem solving provides a gift. There's immediate uh, uh, relief, there's an immediate impact, there's an immediate effect on one's social functioning. So uh, moving to the individual level, we did a, a pilot study uh, involving an fMRI scan and self-report of 10 Asian American adults from the Eugene, Oregon community uh, and we exposed them randomly to, to randomly ordered excerpts uh, from <laughs> PST or, or CBT manuals uh, in the fMRI scanner. So this is similar to the smoking cessation study where uh, the smokers were, were exposed to brief uh, smoking cessation uh, ads. In this case, we took uh, cognitive behavior therapy or problem solving therapy manuals and uh, uh, extracted uh, components of these manuals uh, into excerpts, and we uh, presented them to uh, 10 Asian Americans from the community. We did whole brain functional neuroimaging, and we did structural imaging to aid in normalization. And we also had self-report ratings of personal relevance and helpfulness. And then following scanning, we had some questionnaires, including the attitudes toward professional help seeking uh, questionnaire. And so the purpose here was to determine uh, with self-report and with neuroimaging how personally relevant uh, these treatments might be. So here's uh, some 
of the excerpts that were used in the study. So this was the CBT excerpt. When we look at your thoughts, sometimes they're true, not true, or have a grain of truth. We will teach you how to evaluate the accuracy of your thoughts by looking at the evidence. What evidence that the thought is true? What evidence is there that the thought is not true? So this is classic cognitive behavior therapy. Another excerpt, there are many common mistakes or cognitive distortions people make in their thinking. By figuring out what cognitive distortions you may be having, you can respond to situations in a more healthy way. One cognitive distortion is called all or nothing thinking, where you see things in very black and white terms. For example, if you were depressed and unable to finish your homework, you might think that you were a failure and will be a failure forever. So another example of CBT, cognitive distortions, uh, a, a classic component of CBT. A PST uh, excerpt was as follows. One skill that may help you is called problem definition or the clarifying nature of a problem. You will learn how to set a realistic problem solving goal and identify the obstacles that are currently preventing you from reaching that goal. For example, if you want to raise your GPA, we'll figure out a realistic GPA that you can achieve and identify the very real obstacles that are currently preventing you from reaching it. So these are school examples. We also had family examples and uh, work examples, but this is uh, uh, an example of defining a problem, problem definition, and to uh, set, set goals and to think about obstacles from achieving the goal. Another PST excerpt, uh, one skill that may help you is generation of alternatives in which we teach you to use your creative skills to brainstorm different types of solutions. You will come up with as many solutions as you can. Not all will be the best solution, but it helps you to think uh, of alternatives. For example, if you're struggling to talk to your roommate about cleaning up after themselves, you can use a brainstorming tool to discover that there are many ways to get closer to your goal and to get past the obstacles in your way. Uh, so another uh, example of, of a problem solving approach uh, uh, to, to therapy. So what we found uh, in this pilot study is that neural activation in the PST uh, CBT contrast was greater for PST than for CBT. So the peaks can be seen in the medial and ventromedial prefrontal cortex and uh, the ventral striatum. And these are areas of the brain uh, associated with personal relevance when they're activated. Uh, so uh, PST response, response to these PST vignettes was greater than a uh, response to cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is the, uh, 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 the significance of voxelwise p-value 0.005 in a cluster extent threshold of 20 to adjust for multiple comparisons. So <clears throat> these data on these 10 subjects were compared with norms, and it was found in all cases that uh, uh, PST activation in these areas of the brain associated with personal relevance was greater than response to cognitive behavior therapy. And in terms of self-reported personal relevance correlation, self-reported relevance was uh, associated with helpfulness and positive attitudes towards help seeking. So self-reported personal relevance was uh, associated with uh, the likelihood that one would seek treatment. So if a treatment is seen as personally relevant, a person is more likely to uh, to try to get treatment, that, that makes sense. Uh, relevance and helpfulness were also highly correlated with neural response of personal relevance, but interestingly, self-reported personal relevance of PST versus CBT was not significantly different. So in other words, a person's self-report of the personal relevance of problem-solving therapy versus cognitive behavioral therapy was not statistically significant. Now, again, we only had uh, 10 subjects, we had a few uh, self-report questions, whereas with the neuroimaging, there were many, many more uh, uh, images of the brain that were uh, considered. But uh, uh, neural activation was actually a more sensitive measure of personal relevance than self-report. So this is similar to Elliot Bergman's earlier study with smoking cessation, where uh, the neural activation was a more sensitive predictor of outcome 
than uh, self-report. In this case, uh, the neural response was a, was uh, more strongly associated with, and, and significantly associated with PST more so than with uh, CBT uh, uh, therapy vignettes. So in terms of uh, future directions, we intend to uh, uh, conduct a larger scale fMRI study of personal relevance of interventions among Asian Americans. And we also uh, hope to conduct a randomized clinical trial of CBT versus PST to determine if neuroimaging and self-reported personal relevance predict treatment outcome among depressed Asian Americans. So we want to run this, uh, this model in the smoking cessation study to see if in psychotherapy uh, that personal relevance of, uh, of, a, of a treatment predicts actual outcomes. And uh, uh, this, uh, this line of work uh, leads to a proposal that we try to match individuals with treatments based on personal relevance. So I, I spoke uh, a bit about this yesterday in the Shigatomi Memorial Lecture that was more focused on uh, clinical work, but uh, neuroimaging may actually offer clues as to which treatments are personally relevant to different cultural groups. Uh, I'm not suggesting that practitioners conduct neuroimaging to assess personal relevance, but what we, what we can uh, understand in this basic research is what types of treatments might be most personally relevant to uh, different groups, and then actually offer clients a choice of treatments or, or the order of treatment elements based on personal relevance research. And uh, Jackie Persons and Janie Hong and the Beria have uh, uh, an outstanding chapter on the evidence base for in incorporating client feedback. So some of this client feedback is actually being examined and has been shown to improve the effectiveness of treatments, get, getting uh, actual client feedback, feedback. They're not doing this with uh, neuroimaging or personal relevance per se, but client feedback can guide treatments and, and make them more effective, and there is evidence of this. Uh, public health campaigns more broadly could reach a broader audience by emphasizing the personally relevant aspects of mental health services. Uh, so pu public health campaigns could uh, uh, emphasize uh, to clients that these treatments are going to help you with family or work or school issues or whatever is relevant to you and focus on why they might be relevant for particular groups rather than just having a, a, a universal approach that uh, presumably is uh, effective uh, uh, across people without uh, respect to cultural or, or personal preferences. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, arigato gozaimasu. My Japanese is uh, sort of uh, uh, very elementary, but uh, thanks for your attention. I, I guess we have a little bit of time for uh, uh, questions. What time do we need to finish? Uh, okay, so some questions? Yes. Jack Carr and I had done an outcome study uh, years ago, uh -huh. and we was looking at lumpers and splitters. And what we found is that initially, if you had a match, you had a better outcome in the first part of it. But when you got to 10 sessions, it washed out and, and it didn't matter as much. Yeah. Is that, would you say that would be true? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. So, so you're talking about sort of initial effects versus more long-term effects. And I, I think, you know, I think there is, uh, there, there's, there's uh, you, you, that data makes sense in, in terms of some other, uh, uh, cultural data. So, so there's uh, literature on ethnic matching between client and therapist that uh, suggests similar types of effects. So ethnic matching between client and therapist tends to uh, help with the, the client being engaged in therapy and prevents dropout after the first session. But over time, those effects wear off. So it's, it's quite possible that these, you know, th so this giving idea of, of, of producing something that's immediately relevant to the client, I mean, that may engage the client initially, but then you may want to, uh, you know, focus on these, on cognitive restructuring and some of the 
so-called deeper aspects of the treatment. But I think that engagement piece or the match, the initial match is very important to get the person engaged. And then once you have that engagement, perhaps you can work from that therapeutic alliance, if you will, and then work on, on broader issues or deeper issues. But I think if you don't have that initial engagement and match, you could lose the client. And I think that is happening with uh, many uh, clients of color, either before they come to treatment because they don't see it as relevant, or once they get into treatment and see that the healing model is just at odds with their own, when actually with some tweaking or reordering, it could actually be seen as relevant and could engage them and help them uh, uh, consider broader aspects of the treatment that they may not see as is initially personally relevant. So that that's you know that's uh, that I think resonates with some of the other work in this area. Yes. I wonder if you have some examples of good like public health type campaigns that you've seen really connecting to specific subpopulations. Yeah, so so I guess I should repeat the question. Uh, some good examples of public health campaigns connecting uh, this work to the particular populations? I actually don't. I mean, this is, this is uh, early work, and these are just some preliminary ideas. But I think, uh, uh, you know, many of these public health campaigns are very broad, and they don't, uh, they don't target a specific group. Uh, so I think for many people, the, uh, the message is that this is, you know, this is for people that are unlike me. So even, even, I mean, one component is just who you have in, in, in the images. Are they diverse people? But, but beyond just the images, uh, focusing on issues such as, as work or, or family or school, for, for some groups that might be relevant. So rather, so rather uh, there, there's some mental health literacy work, I think, that does focus on this. But I, I can't think of a good example of this. But the idea would be to help people see this as personally relevant to them rather than, well, this is developed for someone else and it isn't really for me. So the, the message you want to try to communicate is that this, this is relevant for you and people like you rather than this is relevant for a bunch of people that are un, unlike you. Uh, but unfortunately, since this is fairly early work, we don't have good examples of, of public health campaigns. Okay. Go ahead. Follow up on that quickly. Sort of put in like focus groups and fMRI scanners. Is there any other way that you could have a good <coughs> sense of how it's resonating with people in order to craft? Sure. So, so this this client feedback that Jackie Persons and Janie Hong talk about is is a big part of it. Just talking to the client, and so you know, in terms of a practical practical application. Uh, talking, you know, presenting to a client, Here, here's, you know, similar to those excerpts, here's what we do in this approach, here's what we do in this other approach, which of these seems to be, which of these might work for you? And, you know, we're not doing scanning, but you can, you can select those approaches based on this basic research. If they're working with Asian Americans, we have this evidence that this problem solving approach seems to be personally relevant. That would be one of the items on the menu. Here's this problem solving approach that is very practical. We're going to focus on your family, school, and work. We're going to help you be a better student, uh, family member, worker, and so forth. I mean, focus on what is known from the literature and present that to the client and then give them the choice. Does this sound like it'll work? Or, you know, would you like to try this? Or would you like to try this? Or would you like to try this uh, behavioral activation before we try these other, you know, just uh, based on the, uh, uh, on this evidence, giving the client a choice and being informed by what we know and, and those choices being informed by, by, by the research. Uh, so, so I don't know if I'm answering your question, but the idea here is to incorporate this research in the clinical context by uh, knowing what the, you know, what the options are, what the uh, useful, uh, potentially useful treatments are, and then offering the client a, a variety of uh, of, of, of choices. Now, the, the therapist is going to have to be skilled in doing more than one thing, and that, that's, a, that's a big if. But uh, in, in an optimal setting, the, the therapist would have a menu of options and able to offer them to the client, and the client would be able to choose based on what they think is going to work. Okay. Yes? I have a question about what you were saying about quantum feedback. Uh-huh. Yeah, 
Yeah, so, so how does the client uh, feedback help? Uh, how is it incorporated? So this is an ongoing process throughout the treatment, at least the way uh, persons in Hong have reviewed the literature. And, and, the treat, and the course of treatment is shaped by client feedback. So if the client feels like things are going well, you, you proceed with that. If, if things aren't going as well, you reconsider the, the sequence, for example. So if, if uh, the client needs some kind of immediate relief or immediate uh, uh, results, you might focus more on behavioral activation. Where, and, and also, this is to say that the, the, the idea here is personal relevance. So cognitive behavior therapy is going to be very personal rele personally relevant for some people of color. Those who are highly acculturated, those who have high mental health literacy, uh, for some, that's going to be great. So in terms of the client feedback, if you're starting with standard cognitive behavior therapy and the client says, yes, this is addressing my problems, this is exactly what I want to do, that would be client feedback that is uh, 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 support for the approach. But in other cases, the approach might not be going as well. And that's when the, the therapist would consider uh, changing the approach or changing at least the sequence of elements of the approach. Other questions or yes. 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 Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's, it, I have a picture of a gift, so I'm not saying that you should figure out what uh, you know. Give them a nice glass of wine or something. Yeah, yeah, uh, the, this is a symbolic <laughs> gift, but. but but, it's a, but it, I think the gift analogy is, is useful. It's something that's kind of tangible and something that is immediately beneficial. And I think sometimes we don't think about what the client is getting, uh, you know, what, what they're getting out of the treatment uh, immediately. Uh, often, yes, right, right. Well, I mean, you, you want to uh, engage them. You want to give them hope. You want to... Uh, get the central processing going. This is something that's going to help help you. Uh, we, we have uh, interventions that have been designed to help you with your particular problem. So I, I, can, do, I can do something and, and not only talk about it, but actually give them something practical, for perhaps behavioral activation that is going to have an impact in their life from the time you see them this week to the next time you see them. Pardon? Yes, help, help to motivate them and, again, get the central processing going uh, so, so they're really engaged and want to come back and want to actually participate. Are we running out of time? Or? Okay, so we, we need to stop, but thank you for your time and attention.